This is a production of Cornell University. Hello. Thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm Joni Mikowski in the English Department in the Creative Writing Program, and it's my extreme pleasure this afternoon to introduce our guest, Marilyn Chin. First, however, let me begin. Uh, please take a look at your cell phone, and you can vaporize it with a laser beam, or you can toss it in the ocean, or you can turn it off. Please do one of those things. All right, and I please um, join me in thanking the Zelazniks who have so generously funded this series. It allows us to bring people like Marilyn Chin. Uh, and also, um, books are for sale here. Um, and uh, there is a reception following in the English Department Lounge. Um, so uh, please take your books to the reception where you can have them signed. All righty. Uh, so, I'm so happy to introduce Marilyn Chin. Marilyn Chin is the author of four collections of, of poems, most recently Hard Love Province, published by W.W. W. Norton in 2014 and winner of the Annisfield Wolf Prize, established in 1935 to recognize books that increase our understanding of racism and cultural diversity. This is the first year that the Annisfield Wolf was awarded in the category of poetry. Marilyn Chin published the novel and manifesto, Revenge of the Mooncake Vixen, in 2009 to great acclaim, a novel she wrote, as she said in an interview, for a younger generation of women readers, my students and my nieces, their beautiful elk, I want to engage with third world wave feminist readers who might listen to Bikini Kill, rap, and Mozart simultaneously. Chin is also a translator and editor and anthologist. Marilyn Chin's writing explores love, loss, erotics, politics. In her writing, the political and personal are interfused and reciprocal. Neither can hide from the other, and neither can hide from the crucible of Marilyn Chin's art. Her writing explores cultural assimilation or cultural abrasion how to write a letter to one's mother after forgetting the Chinese character for love, how to retell, untell, reform the racial, cultural, and gender-based topoi that can over-determine our lives. Chin's writing is informed by her study of Chinese classical verse and also of Irish ballads, American blues, Dickinsonian hymnal forms. Her study of traditions is not the study of the dead, it's the study of what's already living, what in her poems achieves a new, startling, and fierce existence. Her poetry is full of echoes, which she makes to resonate full-bodied, as in her poem, California, with a K, a portrait of the poet wearing a girdle of severed heads. <laughs> for poetry, and here I'm quoting from the poem, for poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the Bethesda boys of its making, where bankers tweet on bows and Humvees on their backs pray for transcendence. In Marilyn Chin's poems, the words of the dead are modified in the very gutsy guts of the living. Slay me with your slumlord panegyrics, she tells us, and flip over so I can see your pastoral mounts and blood on the altar, blood on the lamb, blood in the chalice, not symbolic, but fresh. <coughs> also in her poems, one feels the stately decorum of classical form getting penetrated by contemporary wildness, or is the contemporary wildness penetrated by the stately decorum or classical form? Consider the opening of Let Take a Left at the Waters of Samsara. <clears throat> the poem opens with a traditional seeming natural setting, but this veil slips away to reveal pulsing chaos and paradox. <clears throat> there is a bog of sacred water, I'm quoting now from the poem, behind a hedgerow of wild matter. Near the grave of my good mother, tin cans blossom there. The rust shimmers like amber, a nation of frogs regale, swell-throated, 
bass tone. One belts and rages, the others follow. They fuck blissfully, trapped in their cycle. Note the tin cans blooming, the rust shimmering like amber. What would be beautiful disrupted by pollution, degradation, but not disrupted. This pollution seems also at one with the beauty, the tin cans blooming, shimmering. This artful energy is also a generous philosophical insight that degradation and decay are themselves part of real beauty, of real life. The void created by the loss, by death, cannot be separated by, from the cycle of death and rebirth and its blissful fucking. It is all interpenetration. Chin's poetic instrument is a motley shapeshifter, a fusion. She reminds us that tradition's beautiful forms are not in the service of, in, of the beautiful. They are in service of the real and the now. Marilyn Chin is a rare writer who fuses extravagant formal gifts and sensuous mastery with political bite, passion, and edge. She fuses luxury with need and recalls us to fight tooth and nail for justice and also for the soul's essential luxuries. Please join me in welcoming Marilyn Chin. Yeah, I want to thank the English department and the um, Dallas Nick um, reading series. It's it's so wonderful to be here, and I and I want to thank my my friend, uh, my dear friend um, Joni, and and you know all my friends out there, Shelley and uh, and Elena. I mean, it's just I. It's like coming back to to seeing old friends. You know, it's like yeah, it's great. Um, I'm I'm going to begin with this uh, poem, it's called How I Got That Name, an essay on assimilation. I always begin with this poem because it grounds the reading and autobiography. I have a, I'm, I'm um, recovering from a, from a cold, but I, I'm okay, don't worry about me, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay, yeah, okay. This is called How I Got That Name, an essay on assimilation. I am Marilyn Mailing Chin. Oh, how I love the resoluteness of that first person singular, followed by that stalwart indicative, a B, without that uncertain ing of becoming. Of course, the name had been changed somewhere between Angel Island and the sea, when my father, the paper son, in the late 1950s, obsessed with a bombshell blonde, transliterated Mailing to Marilyn. Nobody dared question his initial impulse. We all know lust drove men to greatness, not goodness, not decency. And there I was, a wayward pink baby, named after some tragic white woman, swollen with gin and nembutal. My mother couldn't pronounce the R. She dubbed me number one female all shoot for brevity. Henceforth, she will live and die in sublime ignorance, flanked by loving children, the kitchen deity, when my father dithers, a tomcat in Hong Kong trash, a gambler, a petty thug who bought a cha chain of chop suey joints in Piss River, Oregon, with bootleg Gucci cash. Nobody dared question his integrity, given his nice, devout daughters and his bright, industrious sons, as if filial piety were the standard by which all earthly men were measured. Oh, how trustworthy our daughters, how thrifty our sons, how we managed to fool the experts in education, statistics, and demography. We're not very creative, but not adverse to rote learning, rote learning, rote learning. Indeed, they can use us. But the model minority is a tease. We know you are watching now, and we refuse to give you any. <laughs> oh, bamboo shoots, bamboo shoots. The further west we go, we'll hit east. The deeper down we dig, we'll find China. History has turned its stomach on a black, polluted beach where life doesn't hinge on that red, red wheelbarrow. But whether or not a new lover in that final episode of Santa Barbara will lean over a scented candle and call us a bitch. Oh Lord, where have we gone wrong? We have no inner resources. Then one redolent spring morning, the great patriarch Chin peered down from his kiosk in heaven and saw that his descendants were ugly. One had a squarish head and nose without a bridge, another's profile long and knobbed as a gourd. A third, the sad, brutish one may never, never marry. 
And I, his least favorite, not quite boiled, not quite cooked, a plump pomfret simmering in my juices. Too listless to fight for my people's destiny. To kill without resistance is not slaughter, says a proverb. So I wait for imminent death. The fact that this death is also metaphorical is testament to my lethargy. So here lies Marilyn Mailing Chin, married once, twice to so-and-so, a Lee and a Wong, granddaughter of the virtuous Rikwin Wong and Gigi Chin, the infamous, sister of a dozen, cousin of a million, survived by everybody and forgotten by all. She was neither black nor white, neither cherished nor vanquished, just another squatter in own bamboo grove minding her poetry when one day heaven was unmerciful and a chasm opened where she stood like the jaws of a mighty white whale or the maw of a metaphysical Godzilla. It swallowed her whole. She not flinch nor writhe nor fret about the afterlife but stayed solid as wood happily though gnawed, tattered, mesmerized by all that was lavished upon her and all that was taken away. Elena and I read this, we were on stage and read this, <laughs> read together. I read this poem in, in LA, was it in LA? Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. Um, <coughs> okay, so there are many ways to, to write an immigrant anthem, and that's one way. And, may, and so I decided to write a blues poems. And, um, and I was in inspired by Bessie Smith. So um, this one is called Blues on Yellow. And I add to it that one drop of yellow blood. The canary died in the gold mine. Her dreams got lost in the sieve. The canary died in the gold mine. Her dreams got lost in the sieve. Her husband, the crow, killed under the railroad. The spokes had shorn his wings. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. 10,000 yellow belly sapsuckers baked in a pie. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. 10,000 yellow belly sapsuckers baked in a pie. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. Die, die, yellow bird, die, die. Oh, crack an egg on the griddle, yellow will ooze into white. Oh, crack an egg on the griddle, yellow will ooze into white. Run, run, sweet little Puritan, yellow will ooze into white. If you cut my yellow wrists, I'll teach my old toes to write. If you cut my yellow wrists, I'll teach my yellow toes to write. If you cut my yellow fists, I'll teach my yellow feet to fight. Do not be afraid to perish, my mother. Buddha's compassion is nigh. Do not be afraid to perish, my mother. Our boat will sail tonight. Your babies will reach the promised land. The stars will be their guide. I am so mellow yellow, mellow yellow. Buddha sings in my veins. I am so mellow yellow, mellow yellow. Buddha sings in my veins. Oh, take me to the land of the unreborn. There's no life on earth without pain. So I'm going to talk a little bit about about Hard Love Province. Um, uh, in 15 years, I I lost two boyfriends, my mother and my grandmother, and I was really I mean sad for a long time. So I wrote elegies, a bunch of elegies. So uh, and a lot of and I collected. Um, Several, you know, several long ones in this um, in this volume, and I'll I'll read this one. But I, of course, I couldn't 
stay sad, and I started writing some weird stuff, as sexy stuff as well. But um, I, I'll read one elegy. It's called Formosan Elegy. What is, do you remember what Formosa means? Are there Taiwanese out there? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's the uh, Portuguese yeah uh, name for yeah the, it's an old name colonial name for uh, for Taiwan, Formosan elegy. You have lived six decades and you have lived none. You have loved many and you have loved no one. You wedded three wives, but you die. You lie in your cold bed alone. You sired four children but they cannot forgive you. Knock at emptiness, a house without your love. Strike the top pine box, no answer, all hollow. You planted plums near the gate, but they bear no fruit. You raised herbs in a veranda, fresh and savory. I cry for you, but no sound wells up in my throat. I sing for you, but my tears have dried in the gullet. Walk the old dog, give the budgies a cool bath, cut a tender melon, let it bleed into memory. The robe you wash hangs like a carcass flayed. The mug you loved is stained with old coffee. Your toothbrush is silent, grease mums your comb. Something's lost, something's made strong. Who will cry for you, me and your sister Colette? Who will cry for you, me and your Algerian sister? You were a rich man, but you held on to your poverty. You were a poor man who loved gold over dignity. I sit near your body bag and sing you a last song. I sit near your body bag and chant your final sutra. What's our place on earth? Nada, nada, nada. What's our destiny? War, grief, maggots, nada. Arms, cheeks, cock, femur, eyelids, nada. Cow, ox, lamb, vellum, marrow, nada. Vova, nada. Semen, nada. Ovum, nada. Eternity, nada. Heaven, nada. Void, nada. Birth and death, the same blackened womb. Birth and death, the same white body bag. Detach, detach, we enter the world alone. Detach, detach, we leave the world bone lonely. If we can't believe in God, we must believe in love. We must believe in love. We must believe in love. And they zip you up in your white body bag. White body bag. White, white body bag. <laughs> so. The, the incantation, I, I mixed nada, which is Spanish, with, with, uh, with um, um, Zen prayer, you know, so. Uh, so now for levity, I'm going to read 25 haiku, and I'll talk to you about the genesis of the, uh, the series. I was at an artist colony, I was at Yaddo, <laughs> and and these dudes were sitting, you know, I think that most of them were composers, they were sitting around, and they were having a haiku party without me. <laughs> and so I decided to go back to my dungeon and write these bad girl, libidinous, anti-zen haiku. <laughs> now, if they're anti-zen, could we call them haiku? Perhaps not. We'll call them 17-syllable things. <laughs> 25 haiku. A hundred red fire ants scouring, scouring the white peony. Fallen plum blossoms return to the branch. You sleep, then harden again. Are you sure you're old enough, young man, to be in this room? <laughs> to hear this stuff? I guess you are. I mean, I get it. Well, you know, you're. All right. I'm always speaking on this guy over here. He's, he's got a sense of humor. <laughs> C 
cuttlefish in my palm stiffens with rigor mortis. Boy toys can't love. Neighbors, barn, grass mat, crickets, blue boy, trowel handle, dress soaked in mud. Iron-headed mace, double-studded halberd, slice into emptiness. Oh, fierce ogoos, tie me to two wild elephants, tear me in half. Forceps, tongs, bushy, whip, flanks, scabbards, stirrups, goads, distaff, wither, owl. Black-eyed Susan's Queen Anne's lace, bounty of cyclamen, moan past, erupt. Gaze at the charred hills, the woebegone kiosk. We are all God's hussies. I have not fondled the emperor's lapdog, whose name is Black Muzzle. Urge your horses into the Miss Swill Galilee, oh sweet bedlamite. Her Majesty's landing up the jewel stairs to find the pleasure dome. Ancient pond, the frog jumps in and in and in, the deep slap of water. The frog jumps into the ancient pond. She says, no, I am not ready. Coyote cooked his dead wife's vagina and fed it to his new wife. I plucked out three white pubic hairs and they turned into flying monkeys. Let's do it on the antimacassar, on the antimacassar. That's a real nerdy joke. Okay. <laughs> Little Red drew her teeny pistol from her basket and said, eat me. Chimera, Madame Pol Pot grafting a date tree onto a date tree. His unworthy appendage, his mutinous henchman, grazed my pink cheeks. He on top now changes to bottom. God is welcomes her devotee. Fish, fish, foul, foul, mock me, Mistress Bean Curd. I am both duck and essence. Sing, sing, little yellow blight. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Don't touch him, bitch. We're engaged. And besides, he's wearing my nipple ring. The last haiku is a found haiku. I swear I heard it. Uh, I heard my, one of my students say, say something to that effect into her cell phone. So it's a found haiku. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to revive those old forms, those um, corrupted by, uh, you know, by high school teachers and what, uh, and by <laughs> Hallmark greeting cards, right? <laughs> this one's called Black President. I think we haven't written enough poems for the, our dear besieged president. Have you written a poem for him? No. See? <laughs> What's that all about? It's a momentous thing to have a black president in the United States and no one's and you guys haven't written a poem for him. Okay. This one's called Black President. So it's it's a it's a sonnet, you know, uh, it's a compressed sonnet. It's also uh, I'm, uh, it's also a Chinese lyric, so Black President. If a black man could be president, could a white man be his slave? Could a sinner enter heaven by uttering his name? If the Terminator is my governor, could a cowboy be my king? When shall the cavalry enter Deadwood and save my prince? An exo-cannibal eats her enemies. An endo-cannibal eats her friends. I'd rather starve myself silly than to make amends. 
Blood on the altar, blood on the lamb, blood in the chalice, not symbolic, but fresh. Yeah, you <laughs> nail that, <laughs> that last couplet, right? <laughs> oh. uh, what, some of you were forced to read my, my poems and so forth. <laughs> A captive audience is something you want to hear, anybody? Um. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Huh? More. More. You just want to hear more. Okay. Great. <coughs> and so, so I've been playing with Eastern and Western forms, and so I, uh, I cross dress and write fiction sometimes, as you know. Um, and so the the mediary form, intermediary uh, area form is the high bun. So I've been writing uh, this uh, Japanese haiku, uh, high bun form, um, mostly created by, uh, by Basho. Um, and it's, 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 it's a, um, it's a um, poetic, a poetic prose poem form, um, but punctuated by a, by a, a, a little haiku in the end. Um, but this one, I, I am punctuating the, um, the, the, the prose poem, the Haibun, with a verse that you will recognize. Um, study Hall deterritorialized. I wrote this poem for Gwendolyn Brooks. I, um, I, went, to, I went to this uh, high school to give a reading, and I couldn't tell whether the, st the students were arguing and fighting or having a great time. And it's just one of those crazy uh, California classrooms, though. So. Study hall, deterritorialized. The brown boy hits me, but says he is sorry. The brown girl, his sister says, it's because he likes me. I say, yuck, he likes me. Well, I hate him. The black girl pinches me and says, scaredy cat, tattletale, little pussy. I dare you to hit back. The white girl grabs my Hello Kitty purse and spills my milk money. I karate chop her arm. The white boy says, my father says that your father's egg rolls are made of fried rat penises. I answer, yep. My father says that the reason why his egg rolls are made of fried rat penises is because Americans are weirdos and like to eat fried rat penises. The black girl laughs deep from her gut and high fives me. Just as I am redrawing the map, my little fresh off the boat cousin from Malaysia starts weeping into her pink shawl like a baby. Wah, 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 wah. The white girl muffles her ears. Can't you shut her up? I say, don't cry, little cousin. It's not as bad as it seems. It's verse. That's. That's a pun, a bad pun. Okay. All right. I point to the window and magically to entertain us, two fat pigeons appear cooing on the sill. The boy is sitting on top of the girl trying to molest her. She is wobbling, shuffling, pirouetting under his weight. He is pecking a red ball spot on her skinny neck and singing, we will coo. We real fools, we real cool, we real fools. I think Gwen Brooks is <laughs> laughing in heaven, I think. <laughs> okay. Finally, we all laugh as one, laughing and laughing at God's beloved creatures behind this spectacle, against all odds, from the West, a strong explosion of sun, bullies through the big gray loogie of a cloud. I wanted to use loogie in a poem. <laughs> so, so, um, this one is called Brown Girl Manifesto. And, um, and I wanted to uh, put extra beats to the, to the line, to, the, to these quatrains. And, um, And there's a little, little rapping action here. And um, um, 
and I, I, I have a little dig against uh, Ezra Pound in here, so it's called Brown Girl Manifesto. Metaphor, metaphor, my pestilential aesthetic. A tsunami powers through my mother's ruins. Delta, delta, moist loins of the republic succumb to the low-lying succubus Do Flagpole, flagpole, my father's polemics. A bouquet of fuck you bastard flowers. Fist me, embrace me with your phantom limbs. Slay me with your slumlord panegyrics. Flip over so I can see your pastoral mounts, your sword slighty, slightly parting from the scabbard. Girl skulls piled like fresh baked loaves. A foul wind scours my mother's cadaver. Ornamental, oriental, techno impresarios. I am your parlor rug, your chamber bauble. Love me, stone me, I am all yours. Pound, pound, my father's Ezra. Freedom, freedom, flashlet tooting girls dancing on the roof of the Machia Doras. Uh, so that's, that's. That's for the sisters over the, the past, over the borders of El Paso, right? Yeah. So. Shall we some bad girl fiction? Okay. <laughs> what, what do you want to hear? Is, it, is it you guys who were forced to read so, uh, a segment? Um, let me read, okay. Let me read Fox Girl. Oh, I have this uh, bottom that doesn't have any numbers on it, have it on the pages. Fox Girl. Okay. Uh, this this is wonderful character in uh, in um, in Chinese and Japanese and Korean uh, in most yeah in in uh, um, various uh, Asian myths. Uh, um, she's the fox girl and she's she's lascivious. She's difficult and she um, and in the Chinese version she often uh, molests. Uh, um, male poets <laughs> in the deep of night, male scholarly poets, and I and don't know why, but <laughs> that's <laughs> and so um, so this is uh, <laughs> an American version, um, and you know um, it's it's really about my time at Iowa City in my youth, and I will name names afterward. All right, when, we, uh, when I sign your books, when we uh, have a little champagne, okay. Fox Girl. There was a so-and-so Mr. Famous Poet who had a bad reputation around the country for sexually harassing graduate students. The usual fare was that he would go on a college book tour, get stark raving drunk and chase dark exotic looking female students, yes, he preferred the exotic ones, and tried to lure him, them to his hotel room. He was as well known for his gluttony and voracious appetite for gourmet food, drink, and lechery as he was for his poetry. Faux pastorals with shepherdesses and woolly sheep all over the green hillocks of Arcadia. Because he was so famous, nobody bothered to tell him that groping female graduate students was no longer cool. Nor in his acclaim did he realize that policies had been put in place in universities for such behavior. He could actually get fired. 
Likewise, nobody bothered to tell him that poetry, that his poetry was no longer relevant. The great Norton anthology in the sky had already replaced his entries with a younger, hipper, Croatian Navajo surrealist. <laughs> I know these are all academic jokes, you know. One day, he was on the last leg of yet another reading tour. He landed on a Midwest airstrip near a famous writing program, surrounded by bean and cornfields and majestic hog feeding operations. A young graduate student on a research fellowship was assigned to drive Mr. Famous Poet, Mr. Famous Poet around. She was so she was to pick him up from the airport, take him around town to get his fill of peanuts and Bombay gin, deliver him to a local bistro for supper with other writers and graduate students. Finally, her last task of the evening was to deliver him in one piece, drunk or sober, to the university to give his poetry reading. The graduate student was a little Chinese girl born in Hong Kong and raised in San Francisco. Around five foot two, a bit thin, but spunky with a confident spring to her walk. Presently, she was writing a critique on Brecht's alienation effects in Chinese acting and was finalizing an experimental poetry thesis filled with reverse fables in which little girls speak in the personas of the most hapless and vilified of animals. With activist zeal, she wrote compassionately on behalf of the pea brain stegus Saras, the doomed dodo, and common roadkill. She mocked up an entire new vocabulary to sustain the wealth of sounds and utterances foreign to human ears. Almost as soon as she introduced herself to Mr. Famous Poet at the airport, he grabbed her breasts and said, why don't you and I ditch the rest of them and go to my hotel room? The, stu the student turned beet red in the face and said, OK, Mr. Famous Poet, whatever you say. But in exchange, you have to pull some strings and get me a tenured teaching job, preferably in California. <laughs> he said, of course, my, influences, my influence is long and wide and reaches all the way to even California. These are such terrible academic jokes. I mean, I know we're all in academia here. <laughs> as soon as they both entered the car, the girl started yelping and shaking as if she were possessed by a demon. Her long black hair volumed up into a fluffy red coat. She grew a perfect little perky pink snout and a huge, magnificent tail. Before his very eyes, she turned into a beautiful red fox. She quickly leapt onto his lap, rubbed against his chest, and climbed up onto his shoulders and bit his ear with a seductive little growl. <laughs> he was mesmerized by her. Her wild fur and musky perfume gave him an urgent heart on. A violent rush of passion shot into his groin. He was so turned on that he could already feel the sperm percolating on the bulb of his penis. <laughs> oh, shock, you guys are shocked, I know. Especially the Chinese American students out there. You didn't know that your auntie could be so crude. He, he had never fucked a graduate student fox before. <laughs> never a wild animal, a few tamed lambkins and his own cocker spaniel, but never a wild animal. So he said, hold on, hold on, little red fox, and went to the, his trunk to get condoms from his briefcase. One cannot know what kind of sexually transmitted diseases are harboring inside fox vaginas, he thought. I can't believe I wrote this, but. <laughs> it must, you know, I wanted to embarrass my ancestors, and here we go. 
When he got back into his car with his rib Trojans, the fox suddenly transformed into another creature. Her beautiful red fur suddenly turned stark black. In one bold stroke, a brilliant white stripe raced down her back as if it were a dividing line on the highway. The fox on his lap had suddenly turned into a 200-pound gargantuan skunk. And before he could throw her off, she raised up her skirt of a tail and sprayed a foul yellow varnish all over him. This poet really stinks. <laughs> this is bad puns. I miss. I am not being so much literary, but literal. He smells like he hasn't taken a bath for months. He professes that he is writing an epic, not just a personal epic of the likes of Whitman, which he deems as an inferior kind, but a classical epic of the likes of Homer, filled with gods and heroes in full regalia. Henceforth, he, had no t he has no time for taking a shower and doing things that ordinary mortals do. He shall, forever, for the rest of his life, trace around his apartment, wearing a tattered terry cloth robe, inhaling hand-rolled cigarettes, and drinking endless goblets of Bombay gin spritzers. With such modest talent and penis size, he shall spend his last days wrestling the ghost of Homer. Such, <laughs> okay. The revelation of this poet's putrescence soars all the way up the hierarchical food chain. First, the small magazines reject his poems. Then the Poetry Society rescinds its invitation. The Ford Foundation formally withdraws its fellowship money. His putrescence can't be masked by huge, emblematic, perfumey flowers or grandiose adjectival phrases. One such sadness befalls this lecherous poet. He can no longer partake in groping young females because none could stand to be close to him. Nobody invites him to give readings because his epic is boring. One day as he is contemplating a poem and delighting in a jar of sweet pickles, and as he is looking out his office window to the lawn, a beautiful Little fox saunters by. Her fluffy tail arches way up like the headdress of a proud warrior. At first, he feels a small renaissance in his pants. That's a nice pun, right? No? Okay. Then he is stricken with an overwhelming fear and repulsion, putting to flight the triggering aftertaste, weirdly sweet and bitter, of nostalgia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you have questions? Yeah, yeah, questions and uh, yes, the dude back there. What? Oh. <laughs> One of them won the, new, the Nobel Prize. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Well, that, that was an era in which, oh, it was just, uh, you know, which um, the graduate student females were off were for, you know, were off for, you know, they're there for slaughter. I mean, it was just as a straight, yeah, that era when I, um, yeah, I don't think it's like that anymore, is it? I don't think so. <laughs> no, I, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a different time now. But yeah, there were those male poets. And yes, they, they were, yeah, it's all true. <laughs> Other uh, questions? Come on, don't be shy. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Against Obama, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't. You know what? You know what? When he won the presidency, I was raw, raw. I just, I'm still raw, raw. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I. Um, it's, it's amazing that that we have a black man for, 
you know, as our president. I mean, we have a black president. I mean, that's amazing, given what's uh, our, the history of this nation. And I don't know why people are silent about this, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, against, yeah, I don't know. Oh, you're an Obama hater or what? Yeah, yeah okay, we outed you as an Obama hater, okay. <laughs> I don't know, improvise, I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Another uh, question, come on. Come on, you guys had some good questions this afternoon. Yeah, come on. I, okay, okay, sister over here in the red. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, uh, it was easy for him because my mother and my grandmother couldn't read English. So, yeah, and they're gone now. So, I, you know, and I wrote some devastating poems, you know, against my father because, you know, I'm st I still have father issues um, because he was a bigamist and so forth. Uh, um, but, you know, I just, I don't know. I, I feel that I have to tell tell my story, I have to write these poems. I, it is so urgent and, um, and, and it, it helped that my, my mother and grandmother couldn't read, you know, <laughs> read English. <laughs> that really helped, so I just wrote whatever. But I think it is, it is, it is difficult, but you, ha you have to be uh, truthful. You have to tell the truth. You can veil it in many, many ways, right? That's the art of you know, the art of poetry. Yeah. Are there, um? well, then let's talk about reception. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.